Nation, and welcome to Diversity and Inclusion in the Workplace. I'm Tracy Power, Chief People Officer at VACO, a talent and solutions firm providing expert consulting, permanent placement, executive search, and strategic staffing for companies across the country and around the world. And I'm honored to be joined today by two accomplished and outstanding leaders in the DNI field. First, we have Ashley Davis. Ashley is the Vice President and Senior Diversity and Inclusion Manager at Alliance Bernstein. In this role, Ashley is responsible for expanding and leading AB's diversity and inclusion strategy in San Antonio and AB's global headquarters here in Nashville, and the assessment and, cult and cultivation of key community partnerships and partnering with AB's senior executives to implement effective and measurable DNI action plans. Her most recent former role was as global lead for external affairs and strategic partnerships with the global inclusion and diversity team at Cargill. Prior to Cargill, Ms. Davis served more than six years in the Obama administration, both within the White House and as a presidential political appointee with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where her roles included White House liaison and senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. Ms. Davis holds a BA in politics and philosophy from the University of Pittsburgh and a Juris Doctor, Doctorate from the Howard University School of Law. And Robert Wilson, founding partner of Culture Shift Team. Robert leads CST's diversity, inclusion, and equity divisions with more than 15 years of experience in diversity management, multicultural marketing, customer experience strategy, and leadership development. Robert develops comprehensive strategies and training development and training for corporations, nonprofit organizations, higher education and government agencies. In addition to overall inclusion strategy, Robert also provides racial equity strategies and deployment expertise. Robert served in executive roles at Nissan North America, including the director of customer experience and Nissan's first director of diversity inclusion where he developed and led Nissan's diversity practice spanning Nissan's operations in both North and South America, as well as, as, well as multicultural marketing strategies. He serves on a number of leadership positions on three nonprofit organizations promoting greater access to quality education for our nation's most at risk student populations. He's the co-founder and executive director of the Tennessee Diversity Consortium and Robert holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in business administration from Duke University. Thank you both so much for participating in our conversation today. Absolutely, it's good to be here with you. Good Thank you. Here. Thank you. So for our webinar participants, you're currently muted, though our panelists and I wanna hear from you. So if there are questions you have for our esteemed guests, please just type those into the chat and we're gonna do our best to get to those. So as I begin, Ashley, thinking about this conversation, how, how do you really define diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Sure, thank you, Tracy, and, and thanks to the entire VACO family um, and, and to all the virtual attendees I can't see, but I feel uh, us virtually <laughs> connected here uh, in our new normal, at least for now, as we stay healthy and safe together. Um, when I think about diversity and inclusion, and in fact at AB, we we actually begin all of our conversations by defining D and I, uh, mm -hmm. and not making assumptions about whether or not everyone's on the same playbook here. Um, diversity is a fact; inclusion is a choice. Um, we are all diverse in some respect, right? So, um, and even before we can open our eyes, just because we are two separate people, we know we are diverse. What that doesn't mean is that we're all going to have the same opportunities, be included uh, and have our voice valued at the same rate. So when we think about diversity, I think it's important for us to recognize uh, two things. One, that it is certainly a fact that we are all diverse in some metrics. Two, uh, also the diversity isn't just the differences that you're comfortable with. So it's not okay uh, to say, look around the room and go, well, she said we're all diverse, so we, we've done it, let's ring the bell. Uh, because without a doubt, we know that there are diversities that we run away from because there, there are, is discomfort with that difference. And so we have to embrace it and include people, not just also in the way we want them to fit in, um, but in a way that they can enjoy being who they are as well. And so we like to say the, use the adage here that many people likely have heard that diversity is being invited to uh, the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. Uh, but we take it a step further and say that it's not enough to ask me to dance if you want me to dance your way. 
And so don't hire someone and bring them into your organization and ask them also to speak at the same tone, to ensure their hair looks the exact same way, uh, that their diction mimics that of your executive team, because then you're missing out on the richness of their, their true diversity as well. Um, so that, that's, that's how I would, I would think about it. Robert, anything to add? I can't possibly improve upon that definition. The only thing I would say is, you know, I think the missing link, and Ashley probably agree, is the equity piece. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, a lot of organizations are, that's been one of, the, I think, one of the really powerful things that's happened this year is that we're having to start, starting to have a much more thoughtful conversation about what it means to be equitable within our organization, what equity means. And equity essentially is really removing the barriers and obstacles um, mm -hmm. to everyone being able to have the same opportunity to contribute and achieve in an organization. Um, so we're gonna talk about that I think more as we go, but I think now I think the equity piece has really been elevated in the last six months in a way I think that's really constructive. Yeah. Well, and speaking about you know those conversations, I mean, D, D and I or DE and I conversations have been going on for years. I mean, organizations have been talking about this for a number of years. You all um, have worked in these roles for, for a number of years. Why is the conversation, or what has made the conversation different in the last four months? Um, yeah, the last four months has been, have been very different, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I would say, uh, from my perspective and talking to a lot of different companies and uh, lately, I find myself talking to more leaders than I was maybe a year ago with organizations that the people that reach out to me and to culture shift team are tending to be more people, uh, more senior in organizations. And so mm -hmm. I think the events of the last, you know, really six months or so uh, have gotten the attention of leaders within organizations in a way that maybe they weren't before. Mm -hmm. There's an understanding that this path, this is gonna, we're gonna have to be thinking about diversity, inclusion, equity as a path forward. There seems to be um, an acknowledgement uh, from leaders who maybe were on the fence, um, but hadn't fully engaged that they, that they need to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, that's a call to allyship and ambassadorship, which I think are two important components. So the difference for me has been, you know, beyond the you know, external um, shocks that, you know, we've had in the, in the kind of double whammy of COVID and um, the racial unrest and the policing, policing challenges and issues that we've had. I think it's that the leaders have responded to it in a way that really we probably haven't seen leaders respond to in this country in 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in that way, it's, in that way, it's, again, it's constructive. It's a good pathway forward for us that these folks are not, they're asking to talk to me as opposed to delegating that to someone else in the organization to do. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. I have to agree. Look, Robert, when you mentioned, um, Kind of the double whammy of this year who who would have who had on their bingo card that this decade would start the way it has um it has um swept us all up but i think it's placed us intentionally in a space where we can't ignore what's going on around us uh, when we think about this i call it almost a perfect storm of a global pandemic coming in and literally making us all stop in place we cannot you know can't move you're not getting on a plane for months at a time unless it's absolutely necessary you're thinking twice about said vacation, but as a result, we're all in our homes. We're consuming media and on our phones. And um, God knows I live within this square box of my, my Mac more than I ever have. Um, but in that same space, we can't turn off what is happening. So when Christian Cooper uh, is uh, harassed and, 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 and treated as he was over Memorial Day holiday uh, for simply existing in a space and having the color of skin he had, or, or when Mr. Floyd is murdered in a city um, like Minneapolis and that prides itself on being r rather progressive, we couldn't turn that off, that, that, that awakening. And many of us, if we're honest, we've been hitting the snooze button every time something like this happens. Um, we have a privilege, many of us, to simply go, well, that's happening in that city, or God forbid it happened in a Southern city. And we go, well, you know, that's the South. When we don't recognize that these type of um, truly hurtful brutalizations of bodies is happening everywhere, not just in America. We saw protests in London, we've seen it in, in Belgium, we've seen it around the world, and it's a bit of a spark 
that has light lit up everyone around the world to pay attention. But yes, COVID made us very much aware of inequities too, to Robert's point, because we saw how quickly we could racialize uh, a, a pandemic and point out, well, you're the cause of why my life is upside down. Um, we are, have not grown as much as we thought we had. Um, and, and this is an opportunity where I think our consciousness is at a heightened level that makes us quite responsible for what we do next. Uh, and not enough to just say, well, the next generation will figure it out. Um, for some reason, we're all just quite privileged to be the generation that needs to figure it out and make it better. Um, and it's quite quite the, the undertaking, I'd say. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, the, I think the events over the last six months, as you said, Robert, really have just heightened the conversation internally with, with, with corporations as well. And some of those conversations aren't, aren't um, comfortable for a lot of folks to have. I think, I think, you know, employees were looking for organizations to respond to what they were seeing in society, and we're starting to have those conversations. So um, how do you engage, though, in that conversation, Ashley, you know, about diversity, about equity, and about inclusion, if your employees are afraid of saying the wrong thing, or maybe even your leaders are afraid of saying the wrong thing? Sure. You no, know, I think um, we've got to do a, a couple of things. One, the first step I would tell everyone is be really honest well, with everyone around you, that this is a journey. This isn't a program where we're gonna start at 12, we'll all be getting along beautifully by 1 p.m. It's not a 60 minute engagement. This is uh, a lifelong journey. In fact, we use the language of cultural humility, that this should be a lifelong process of you refining, being more aware of how you show up, that intent versus impact, how you intend to show up versus how you're actually impacting your colleagues. Um, and there has to be buy-in whether it's the marketing department, accounting, HR, it's not just DNI's job to figure out how to make this a more inclusive culture. And if that's your approach to it, it will continue to fail, no matter how big the check is that you write, no matter how many diverse interns you bring in, they will likely either leave right out of the door you brought them in, or you will find them find, looking around and going, I don't even see myself in the senior ranks. And so that intentionality has to live and breathe in a way that before you write the PD to bring the person in, you've done a current state assessment. And sometimes that takes, without a doubt, bringing someone from the outside in um, to, to assess where you are on your journey. Um, and the other part I would say is that you, you've got to, and I'm, I'm on a bit of a, uh, a bandwagon on this, I believe that the word privilege has to be um, uh, sanitized. I think people need to embrace their privilege in a way that we have never done before. Uh, we have to sit with the fact that yes, you may be incredibly bright, astute, and positioned appropriately for your role, but it is very much likely that you got there because someone was sponsoring you and looking out for you in the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. And that you and I could have similar resumes, but the moment you walk in, you look like the leader and for some reason I don't. And let's be honest about the systems that are in place and do one of two things, either give your seat up or build a bigger table. But stop mm -hmm. saying that people just need to wait for their opportunity. Um, it doesn't need to, to be the 20 something that just walked into the door, but likely there is someone that is much more richly positioned in their, their professional background that does have the value that you need at the table. Um, so it's not easy work. And it's also probably not something you can do with your current uh, workforce as it is. You're going to have to bring more than just one person in, um, but it's absolutely worthwhile because the numbers keep showing us time and time again that diverse teams outperform those that are not diverse every single time. It is not a guess, they just do. The returns are greater, the innovation goes through the roof. So why wouldn't we all want to be on diverse teams? Um, we, we would benefit all, I believe, in the same space. And Rob, I would love to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, I think uh, it's a couple of things kind of come to mind as <laughs> you're talking. Um, one of them is just the degree to which this is really about leadership Right, and somehow we have this separation of what we're doing in the DEI space and how we counsel people in the DEI space and how we counsel about leadership. Everything you talked about is just leadership, right? Mm -hmm. How am I bringing everyone that is on my team to fully be present, right? How am I creating opportunities for people within my organization to grow and learn and improve? How am I challenging myself to be humble, right? To be vulnerable. I was just with an organization this morning and we were talking about that. They said, you know, it's hard to be vulnerable. And I thought, okay, 
this is no longer a conversation about diversity anymore. Let's put that aside. Now, it's a kind of, now we're going to have a leadership conversation here because somehow these two ideas and these two concepts are getting divided perhaps in ways that they shouldn't. And so you can't talk about, I want to be a great leader in my space, but then also say, well, yeah, what, what is diversity? And what do we, you know, what's the business case for that? I mean, the days of, I think, being able to do that, I think are over. Um, and when I think, you know, the leaders, of organizations, you know, and all of us who are in management roles, who have people responsibility, this is a, this is a core competency. This is a core competency. How are you going to lead the workforce that's going to be around five or 10 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. if, if the only way you're successful as a leader is if everybody looks like you. <laughs> I mean, that just, you start, we start to think through these things and they're irrational, right? Mm -hmm. They're irrational. And so, yeah, I think we, there's a real need um, to expand the way that we think about our inclusion efforts. Mm -hmm. And there's a real need to start to hold leadership accountable for our mm -hmm. inclusion efforts. And the amazing thing that that's really come from the ground up you know, it's really been something that, you know, the, the, the rank and file folks within the big, small, nonprofit, for-profit, mm -hmm. government, university setting, higher. I mean, it's been the really groundswell of people saying, you know, it's time for us to, to lean into this. It's time for us to take this seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think it's interesting that it's the leaders that are now engaged in this conversation are more engaged. And some of those folks are the ones least capable or, or have the least amount of background to be able to have the conversation and hold the conversation. So what advice would you give to a leader who is, wants to have this conversation in their organization, but they're just not equipped to do it or they won't do it because they feel like they, they're not equipped. Yeah, I think uh, you just touched on why I've, I've long believed that our inclusion efforts have not moved further faster than they have mm -hmm. because the group, prim the, you know, the primary group that's in power, right, which, which tends to be at most of organizations, it's male, it's predominantly white, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the group that is perceiving itself to have the less knowledge, the least knowledge about the topic. And so there's a, there's a, there's a sense that I'm gonna run away from this topic rather than talking about it. Um, and it's not to say that it's only those two, but I think, you know, prominently within our, the tops of our organizations, that's what they look like. Um, and so I think, I think what's needed, you know, from whoever it is that's at the top of these organizations, again, is to, is to show the, is to have some of the vulnerability and humility. I'd also say to that, that, you know, I like, you know, Ashley knows I'm an engineer by trade. I think you heard that. And so I end up being maybe too logical in how I think about things, but if I'm leading a company and I don't know about finance, do I just not talk about finance? Do I just not worry about I'm just not going to worry about finance because I don't understand it personally. I don't think it works like that, right? You get someone who understands it, right? You work, but that's someone you currently have in your organization, someone external to you. You get somebody that understands it. It can help you along this journey. What we don't do is just say, ah, oh, you know, I don't understand marketing. So we're just not going to do any marketing. And, then, and it's again, this, these things are so irrational when you really break them down. But the answer, I think, is you got to get help like you would anything else within the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, whether that's, whether that's um, a consultant, whether that's a coach, you just need someone to help you along the lines to, to help you have that conversation or get comfortable with the uncomfortableness yeah. of that conversation. So uh, we talked earlier, Ashley, you mentioned this, the value that D&I programs bring to businesses and employees. Can you give us some more thoughts on that and, and how we really – if there are leaders that are not bought in um, to why it's important to have a, a strong DEI um, fabric within your organization, why they should be why they should be concerned that they don't have that. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. If you're thinking about, it, I know if you're a business leader, then you you likely talk in numbers. You know, uh, want to be in the black, not the red here. So, I mean, think of just basic numbers of, look, where we are heading as a country. Um, we will be majority minority by 2045 at the very latest. It's mm -hmm. likely to be sooner than that. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you think about, I don't care if you're telling, you're selling textile, you're selling sock, um, socks or, or, <laughs> or beans in a can, that means that the demographics of your clients uh, and your customer base is going to be drastically more diverse um, than it is right now. And I always uh, say, whether it's within AB or elsewhere, unless you're in this to make money for a finite amount of time, you have got to grapple with uh, your inclusive culture and the lack thereof. And, and the, the fact that your very product may not uh, exude inclusiveness as well. 
The other part of this in the tone is that there are a ton of companies that have just gotten it wrong where we have enough examples of what not to do. Um, I mean, I, look, I, I had the pleasure of having some good pasta last night. Um, and I think about Barilla Pasta, their CEO, who came out and said that they don't make uh, pasta for gay people. Well, I've never seen a rainbow pasta in my life, but I also know that um, that if I am in a, uh, a market where the LGBT spending power is $3.7 trillion, there's no way in the world I'm saying I don't make uh, pasta for gay people. I make sauce, I make pans, I make it all, right? Um, and so it's just good business sense, even if it doesn't speak to your heart and you don't think it's the right thing to do as a business leader and you owe it to your unit holders, your shareholders, uh, to think about how you can build out your market uh, and your base thoughtfully. And then, then there's just the basic components of uh, realizing um, whether it's Burberry and the, the incredibly um, offensive line they had two years ago with the noose, um, uh, excuse me, it was the noose uh, sweater or the, the caricature blackface. Um, those are clear examples of multinational companies that did not have uh, a, a DNI awareness consciousness in the room, right? Because that had to whether in marketing calls and, and, and strategy and development. And there's one of two things. There either was zero awareness by everyone in the room, which meant everyone's thinking the same way, or two, people didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So you've snuffed out the ability to pe for people to feel comfortable um, and to share dissenting opinions. And we have got, come so very far away from where we need to be in sitting with someone saying something to me that I don't agree with. I don't need you to agree with me. I need you to respect the fact that we have different opinions. And I think the very best thing we could do is start with the understanding that dissenting opinions have a space too, right? And that doesn't mean I can't work with you and be profitable with you. It simply means that I, we're going to disagree here, but agree to get the job done. I, I think that's important. I, I, I look at it I, kind of reinforcing you know, everything that Ashley said. I look at it really in two different ways. One hand, and I, I tell companies this all the time, that when you go along this journey, one of the things that you're going to have to do is figure out how this connects directly to your business, right? And it's different for every organization. Sometimes it's really obvious. For, for some B2Cs, it's, it can tend to be fairly obvious. But when it's B2B, I think that's where it gets a little bit more difficult for people to figure out. But there's example after example of B2B that figured it out. And so when you go on this journey, you need to figure out what the language is going to be and what the internal approach is going to be to link this back to the work and business that you do every day. Because people will act according to their own best incentives, right? Their own best interest. And so if you can link this back to the work that you're doing every day, then you're going to be able to get the behaviors without as much hand wringing. And, you know, I used to talk about, you know, myself, you know, when I was doing this work at Nissan, having to bring a PowerPoint presentation, you know, had a PowerPoint presentation ready, right? But at the end of the day, what ended up moving the needle was that people saw this as, as essential to their own best interest. Okay. So I think that, you know, we talk about the business case and that's that terminology. I'm okay with that terminology, but I like people to think, be thinking about, you know, how, is this work, and it's a lot of work, going to be essential to the business and the work that you do every day? That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is this, that we're moving into this era, and, you know, we talk about people needing to catch up and that, you know, leaders are opening their eyes to this. You're in, and, and, and Ashley talked about the, how the demographics are changing, and so you better be there, and you better be up on this stuff. I am reminded after uh, George Floyd, I'm from Detroit, and I rem I'm reminded of how, about a week after that happened, the leaders of, I think it was seven to 10 leading companies in Detroit all got together, mm -hmm. mask and all. Mm -hmm. And one after the day, they said, we are here because this is it. We're moving on from this. We're, we, are, we are sick of going through this over and over again. And I think it was Mary Barra from GM, I have great respect for her. She said, the first thing we're gonna do at General Motors we are not talking about the business case anymore. We're not having that conversation anymore because part of what she, I think, correctly identified that's happening in a lot of organizations is that we tie, we, we tie ourselves up in having to prove to people another different way. We're gonna prove it to you this way and then we're gonna come around and prove it another way. And we just put our, wrap ourselves in the pretzels trying to make the case 
that this is the right thing to do from the business when that should be overall very obvious. I think an organization's challenge is how is this going to impact the work that we do every day? But mm-hmm. answering the question of why, how diversity drives business in general, I think is we should be beyond that. So I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's the right thing to do, so therefore you do that, right? Um, and 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 you see you see the fruits of that uh, in the results that your organization gets from the people that you attract, from who you retain in your organization, from the decision making that goes on. Absolutely. So when you're thinking about an organization and where they are on their journey, how do you how do you how would you coach organizations to to um, evaluate their strategy to make sure that they're being true to who they are as an organization, or maybe they have to change their strategy to be to be more right um, with what, what what they need to do. How how would you go about coaching an organization to it on their evaluation process? Yeah, I, I'll start. I think number one, have you linked this directly again to the work you do every day? What is that link? Is that link been communicating clear to people? The second thing, how do you run your diversity and inclusion initiatives? Do you run them like the rest of your company? Right? If you run it like the rest of the company is run, then you are communicating to the entire organization that this is important. Three, what is your aspiration? What is it you're trying to accomplish? What's the thing that you're reaching toward and grabbing for when it comes to inclusion? What is that? And what is your North Star? Maybe a better way to say it. Because mm-hmm. everything else is going, to, is going to cascade from what that North Star is. And when you get confused, when you get lost, when you make bad decisions, like we do in every other part of our business, Right, we all we do that every other part of our business. We don't stop doing marketing because we made a marketing mistake, right? <laughs> but, but when you yeah. do that, do it, it's your north star that's going to point you back to you know, where you want to go next and how you want to uh, self-correct in some of the errors that that you're going to never be making. I just want to. I think that's absolutely perfect. Uh, that's textbook uh, goodness there, Robert. Um, uh, what I I just want to touch on the aspirations part, because I think that is so very important and it's lacking in a lot of strategies. Uh, where we, so like you said, North Star, where, where are we going? How, why and why are we, you know, how will we get there? Um, part of that aspirations for me too, um, I've just found that it really matters when um, we look also at how we are spending, uh, where our dollars are going to. So externally, we've been looking at our supplier diversity and how we can bolster that because we believe without a doubt there's a direct tie uh, back and we will see uh, absolute benefits in just ensuring that diverse suppliers have a free and an open opportunity to engage with us as well. And then in the aspirations, we are communicating to Robert's point the same way we communicate our focus, uh, whether it's M&A or it's, uh, you know, it is a focus where we've said, look, we want to uh, focus in on this region of the world, and we see great purpose and prosperity there in, in future years. We are finding that people appreciate when we articulate it that way because they then find their place in pushing that that goal. Um, and we measure uh, intentionally. Everyone at AB globally is required to have a DNI goal. Uh, it is just as important as you saying, "This is how I'm going to develop." In fact, you can have your development goal and your DNI goal tied, but they have to be ambitious. It can't just be, I'm going to attend a, uh, a, a Black employee resource group program before the end of the year. No, I'm going to build out uh, a, a Black uh, student-run uh, talent pipeline that will be uh, budding in my, my part of the business. And so we find that our people are, one, they're challenged and sometimes scratching their heads and going, what in the world do you want me to do here? But when they come together, when our team uh, counsels them, they come out of it, and a year later, they are miles away from where they were uh, in their their cultural humility. And so I I say push your people, incentivize them to do do more, um, and make sure that they're actually being ambitious and not just checking the box, because clearly we've been doing that far too many years. And if an organization hasn't been running um, or hasn't made DEI a part of their fabric, where where do organizations start? I mean, I mean, You've given us a lot of different ideas, both of you, about how you analyze what you currently have. What if, what if you truly have nothing to start with? Where, where does an organization start? And we know there's organizations like that out there. So where, where would you, what advice would you give Ashley to an organization that's just starting on their journey? Robert, you want to go there? I know we we're going back and forth. This sounds like oh. a Robert question. So I was, I was going. <laughs> I, I, you know, um, 
I, I think I can be brief in my answer. Sure. The place that I often ask people to start is to uh, talk to your employees, ask them, ask them what kind of experiences they're having around inclusion at your organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think you might be surprised at, mm -hmm. so if you, if you ask people and you create safe space to, to have the conversation, mm -hmm. I think people are gonna start telling you some things that might shock you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, those are, and, and, and that's the worst, you know, if you think about it from a traditional HR standpoint, worst thing you can ever have is employees suffering in silence. That's the worst thing you got. People yeah. who are just coming in every day, they're not right. fully there, they're not fully engaged, but they show up every day, you know, so that they get the reward at the end of two weeks, right? But you don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, to me, I, there's a few different ways to answer this question, but what's on my mind right now is, is you know, talk, talk to your employees and find out what kind of experience they're having. And then once you hear that, ask them, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And then go from there. Yeah, I, I love that approach to the people component of it because, you know, when I think about it, even the organization that says, look, we, we've got nothing right now. You, you have something. Uh, you absolutely have something under the hood. Uh, whether you activate it or not, I think is the question here. And what Robert's getting to here, um, Rob's saying, look, is you have to activate. And I, and I have to argue, I don't care what organization it is, your greatest, um, your greatest value here, what we all say it, is our, your people. Um, but, but to Rob's point here, look, you, you don't want to uh, create a space where they can sound off if they don't feel safe. So you have to make yourself, uh, yourself vulnerable too, being honest, saying, look, I don't know, but I feel like the answers are amongst us here, or we can at least get there part of the way together. Um, but also create a truly safe space, whether that's an anonymous survey or feedback um, about how, what, are, what is our current state? You know, whether it's the experiences of, uh, of our women in the organization, people with physical or invisible disabilities, um, because it's just not about race. Uh, it is about a lot of other things as well. Um, do we have LGBT people who feel marginalized in this space as well um, and feel voiceless? Uh, is there the immigrant community in your organization um, or those that speak English as a second language that continue to be asked to speak up or speak differently? Um, and so unearth those things and be ready for how uncomfortable it likely will be to receive that feedback. Um, but no, to, to Rob's point here, the, that you're getting beyond having people simply suffer in silence. I, I think that's absolutely uh, what we want to get away from or else none of us would be in the HR realm, I don't think. You know, Tracy, there's a, there's the nature of um, privilege is such that you tend to not see the challenges, obstacles, struggles of those who are not in the majority group, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy. You know, I work, I spent many years in, in engineering. It was very, it was hard for me to see the experience that women were having mm -hmm. in a male dominated field, in a male dominated office, in a male dominated facility. It was mm -hmm. hard, for, you know, to me, everything looked great to me. They, you know, everybody's laughing at the same jokes and it seems great. And then mm -hmm. when you dig deeper and you start asking people, well, what is your experience actually about? They start saying, well, I'm glad you asked. Now let me make my list of things that have been an issue that I just don't bring up because I know you don't want to talk about it. There is, um, if I may, one of the challenges we have when it comes to privilege in particular is that you know people who are in the minority group tend to not want, people in the majority group tend to not like to talk about you know, the, the challenges. So in that way, you know, men tend not to like to talk about issues with gender in the workplace. We just don't like going there, right? <laughs> Whites tend to not talk like to talk about race, you know, mm -hmm. even sometimes viscerally, even bringing up the, the word race feels, mm -hmm. and we all haven't felt that, right? It's viscerally just feels like, oh, am I, am I really going to say this? And right. so it's incumbent for us to I always talk about extending privilege, that mm -hmm. if you have, if you're in that majority group, you've got to extend your privilege. And that mm -hmm. means that you got to walk out there um, mm -hmm. and you got to do the extra thing. It can be difficult, mm -hmm. but again, if you think outside of yourself, um, at the experience that the person in the minority is having, right? I've had people say, you know, it's really hard, you know, talking about race, you know, as, as, as a person, as a non-person of color, it's really, it's difficult, it's, it's, it's emotionally difficult. And I say to them, what do you think your employees of color are going through every day, <laughs> right? right? You put it that way, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll do it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, what, that's that was kind of the earlier question about you know the difficult conversation because you're right there are certain things that people do not want to talk about at work right you always taught don't talk about these things and race just seemed to be one of them as well and so 
with all the conversation that's going on now, it's how do you continue to invite people into that conversation? And and Ashley and Robert, you both I mean, talked about what I talk about a lot is you gotta have that safe space. You gotta have where, where people feel free to have communication and nothing's gonna happen to them, right? It, that they can just emote what they're feeling and what they experience so that they can teach something to someone who has has no frame of reference for that because they just haven't experienced that because of their because of their race, because of their gender, because of their ethnicity, what, whatever the case may be. So we've got a great question that just came in from one of the panelists. So um, I'd love to get um, love to get your thoughts on this. And then we know that Ashley's going to have to jump in a minute too because she has got a really unique opportunity and event that's going on with Alliance Bernstein. So let's get to this question. And then Ashley, I want you to, to tell us what's going on with the HBCUs um, that you all are hosting today um, at Alliance Bernstein. But the question is, what are examples of companies that are successful in DNI strategies and what are they doing differently that makes them unique? I don't know which one of you wants to start with that one. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I'll, I'll share. Um, well, first, let me just say no one's gotten it perfect yet. Um, and I'm not sure <laughs> that that exists. And that, that's honest to say. Um, I would, um, let, let's see, I'm trying to go around industries here and pick someone in this space. Um, I thought you'd pick I, AB because they <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of teased this up for AB. I think they're doing something really, really well, yeah. neat for today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let I'll let Rob talk about AB uh, <laughs> and, and and just the the Nashville of me is being a native. I'm not going to talk about myself. I won't talk about <laughs> AB. Uh, so I'll talk about someone else. You know, I, I'll tell you an organization I, I admire. Um, I think naturally the tech community gets a lot of expo ex exposure and press mm -hmm. for the things that they do. Which don't get me wrong, it is it, it is quite phenomenal. You think about some of the intentional things they're doing. But I actually want to talk a little bit about a, a, um, an organization, a company that doesn't get a lot of spotlight, but it's being rather intentional in the food and ag space. So agriculture is, is a space where they are definitely reckoning with the fact that they have got to get their diversity together quickly. Um, there is a um, consortium uh, called Together We Grow that has uh, got everybody from Cargill to ADM, uh, John Deere, McDonald's, um, mm -hmm. They're, whether they're in food, ag, or you know, a tangent of the such, they come mm -hmm. together and just grapple with the fact that they all have different things they're doing right, but they could do much things much better if they work together. So mm -hmm. instead of fighting for the same one student, they are building a pipeline uh, and a space that allows students to just realize that we just want you to grow in this industry. We want you to bring your talents in this mm -hmm. industry. And so while I'm not giving a specific uh, company, I'm not saying company X is doing it better than Y, I think mm -hmm. the fact that the industry came together and said, let's put our best practices on the table is something that you really hadn't seen before um, in, in a really intentional way. And they even partnered with the Department of Agriculture. Um, this is right before I left USDA um, to get this off the ground so that there was even a government component to it. Um, and it was just really about finding diverse talent and then bringing them in, developing them, and then letting them pick where they want to go from there. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a really unique way and approach to do it. But they also hold each other, uh, they check each other, meaning they have feeds where if um, there's any negative uh, feedback going on online about how people are being treated at work, it said company, mm -hmm. then they bring it back to the group and say, what is going on? And it, there's a trust circle to talk about, um, you know, employee relations there as well. So I found just sitting in those meetings, it's been quite incredible. Um, I think more spaces need to do that. I mean, there is the CEO Action for Diversity that was started uh, several years ago, and AB is a part of that. We found that to be in incredible for us because it's led by your CEO. So Seth leads these conversations for us. Um, mm -hmm. It is not something where um, anyone lower than Seth uh, says, let's do it. No, Seth says it's going to get done. It gets done. Um, and that matters, I think, quite, quite, uh, quite a, a, a bit there. I like that. Yeah. Actually, real quick, do you want to tell us what's going on at AB today? Because I know you're going to have to jump, and then we'll let Robert answer the same question. So how's yeah. that? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And sorry, I do have to jump. Um, but there's 225 uh, college students waiting on me, and you don't keep college students waiting <laughs> to eat or, or uh, talk, <laughs> right. right? I remember I gave my professors a 10-minute warning. How dare we? <laughs> anyway, right? Um, we were late. Um, but AB is um, hosting our first 
uh, HBCU, uh, Historically Black College University Infusion Summit. And so the purpose of this is to uh, bring together the nation's brightest minds, uh, and we believe HBCU minds means they are brightest, to talk about what, how they could see themselves in finance, in business. Mm -hmm. And we have everyone from students are arts majors, philosophy majors, poli sci, some business, some architecture, mm -hmm. um, so a lot of food and ag science. And we're mm -hmm. showing them that no matter what your skills or your focus is, there is an opportunity here for you under the AB uh, umbrella. And so we are um, showing them everything from, um, we're talking to them about professional development. We do a, a, a space called decoding the system, the things that uh, no one's gonna tell you about, but that you are being judged on and you need to make sure you are looking and acting the part. Um, we also talk to them about um, the black dollar. And so we talk to them about how important it is to be thoughtful about financial security and empowerment. Um, and for many of them, look, myself, I'm a first generation college graduate in my family. So I know the immense uh, pressure you feel to, to own your own home, to be able to be prosperous. But we, we make a lot of assumptions to Rob's point here about privilege. There's so much that many of us never had to think about. You didn't have to think about where, how that tuition bill was gonna get paid or could you get an internship or how would you figure out what si size suit you wear? Um, mm -hmm. But my dad didn't wear a suit every day to work. Um, we, you know, we went to church, so I knew wh what he looked like in a suit. But, you know, I didn't understand those components of how to get dressed uh, for a Wall Street job. So we help them and we meet them where they are with no judgment at all. And so we're going to talk to them today. Um, my, my conversation with them is to share a bit about myself uh, and to be, to Rob's point, vulnerable about what I didn't know. And then we're going to talk to them uh, from as a panel I'm hosting after that conversation about from the yard to the boardroom. Um, so many HBCUs have a yard, and we're just going to put it into their terms about how we want to make this accessible. But to this just really quick fine point, um, if you're looking to engage historically Black colleges and universities, if you're in the Nashville area, look, you've got two incredible ones right in our backyard, Tennessee State and Fisk. Um, it takes time. You got to build that trust. There's years of this, you know, mistrust here of feeling like you won't get a fair shot or engage the right way. And so just because it doesn't work that first time, I encourage you to try again to reach out, um, invite them to, you know, 12 students to come to lunch when it's safe to do so. Um, but make that intentional effort because it is paying dividends on our side here at AB. Excellent. Ashley, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it for all your wisdom and for sharing with us. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Anytime you got Rob on the panel, I'll be there. Let me know. All right. Well, we're, we're going to continue our conversation with Rob now. How's that? <laughs> Y'all have a good Thank you, Ashley. All right, Rob, so you want to go back to the, to the yeah, yeah. panelist question? Do you need me to repeat it for you? I don't. I don't. I think okay. um, if I could, so I got a couple of, a couple of reactions. Uh, one, if I could, you know, I, I'm going to give AB some credit. They're probably only their own company I'm going to name. Yeah. And what they're doing with HBCUs and how that impacts. So, you know, you know, we're here in Nashville, but I know there are people that, you know, maybe in other cities. And one of the things I often hear from organizations that, is that you know, we have such a hard time finding talent. You can't find a talent. It's so hard to find a talent. And over the last year and a half, especially my work with the Tennessee Diversity Consortium, we've really been pushing back and telling organizations, what are you doing to create an environment in your community where people of color in particular, but any marginalized community, feels comfortable working, living, and you know, having a good life, if you will, in your community, right? And, and what I often find is that these companies are, are saying, we can't find anybody, but when I ask them, you know, in what way are you investing in supporting local institutions that would attract the talent that you're unable to find? Mm -hmm. it, it kind of goes silent. Mm -hmm. So that's an example. I mean, what, what AB is doing with this particular program is benefiting every other company in Nashville, right? right? Because those students who are never going to work for AB are here saying, I've never been to Nashville before. Wow, this seems, oh, this seems like a really good place to live. They're, they're going to have a fond memory of Nashville from the experience they just had. And so when other companies are reaching out and saying, hey, what do you think about moving to Nashville? They're thinking, oh, that's that fun place we went to that time. You know, of course, we're not, we're not live in person now, but those kind of experiences and putting the resources, it's not always writing a big check to an organization. One of the things I challenge organizations with is, 
when you have a uh, team building exercise, what do you do? You know, do you go to one of, the, one of these types of institutions that are supporting the Hispanic community, the Asian American community? Are you, are you going to, to, to using that time to learn and have fun together in that space? Or are you using that time to support kind of what's always been done? Uh, so I think, you know, with respect to organizations doing a good job, that's the best practice. I think as far as industry, industry wise, the consulting firms mm -hmm. are typically the best, mm -hmm. DNI. But I, I want just really briefly, I want to explain why they end up being the best. They're the best, A, because they recognize that mm -hmm. they're going to be sending consultants into all these different environments. And they don't know what, what kind of environment that consultant's going to land in. So they have to have people that, hey, if, if your boss ends up being a woman, if your boss ends up being white, whatever it is, you got to be able to be very comfortable and at ease in that environment. So it's important to them for that. And then the second reason why it's so important to them is that it got important for one, one of them figured that out. And then in order to compete, the others had to do the same thing. <laughs> right? Is that, is that simple? Right. Somebody got good at that and everybody else said, well, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. Now they've got an advantage of being able right, to put people in a different organization. So we got to do the same. Right. Well, they've expanded their circle. We talk always at Baco about expanding our circle, right? Who can, we, who can we reach out to? And so if you expand your circle, I mean, you're, you're giving opportunity to, to many more folks that, that could better fit or have a better fit in a role, right, because of who they're working with. So one of the things, and we're getting lots of questions now from, from, the, pan, from the audience, which I'd love to get to. We, we talked a little bit about, when we talked about strategy, we talked about looking at your strategy. How do we make, I think one of the fears that a lot of people feel like is we're having a lot of conversations, we're having this webinar, we're talking about DEI strategies. How do we, how does this not become flavor of the month, right? How does this become sustainable in organizations? Because, you know, especially organizations that maybe not have as strong a song strategy as, as, you know, Nissan North America and, and AD, how do we, how do we sustain those over, over the, of the life of an organization. Yeah, I think again, you have to embed it. You have to treat your DEI activities the mm -hmm. same way that you treat any other successful um, mm -hmm. activity within mm -hmm. your organization. You build it into your business plan. You know, when, you know I always ask organizations, let me see your business plan, where's DEI in it? If, you, if you're wanting to talk about, you know, really making a difference in this space, mm -hmm. where is this in your business plan? Mm -hmm. Let me see how you talk about it. Let me, can you show me your communication for a major initiative at the company, mm -hmm. show me your latest DI communication, right? Mm -hmm. What's the tone, right? Mm -hmm. Similar or different? Um, mm -hmm. I ask, we ask people at the culture shift team, we ask people, uh, let's talk about the last change management activity that you all did and how that went well and what you did when you did that. And now show me what you're doing. So I mean, it's just embedding this into the culture of the organization is really how you sustain it. Mm -hmm. I think there's some real value for companies that are large enough to do this, which, you know, your middle, medium sized companies to your large companies, medium size being over the 253 employees. I'm going to call that medium size for the purpose mm -hmm. of this conversation. ERGs, BRGs, business resource groups mm -hmm. are very important. Um, when I got, when I started doing the work at Nissan, the very first thing I did was going after uh, expanding our BRGs. And one of the reasons, so one of the reasons why you do that, is because you activate the employees. And once mm -hmm. you activate the employees, they never go away. The employees that, that you know, <laughs> so you talk about how do I sustain this over time? If employees care about it, if employees are engaging in it, enjoying it, you know, and, and are passionate about it, then it's gonna be something that the organization at the leadership level is gonna be accountable to. Um, and so that's another kind of, for, that's a trick of the trade, if you will, from people who didn't done DNI work, is yeah. get the grassroots, the employees, and, engaged around this and then the organization in some way is internally forced to continue to sustain and work on it. Well, because then it's not an HR initiative or a finance initiative or a marketing initiative, right? It's everybody's initiative right. across your organization. So you're going to get a lot of, they'll get a lot more buy-in. And it also, it, it can survive leadership changes because one of the big okay. challenges with DNI initiatives is that the leadership that was interested or passionate in leads or there's some kind of leadership change then the organization kind of sits back and doesn't do anything. But if you've got the employees involved, then that leader then is kind of in a way forced to understand, okay, what do we do? Why are these people keep asking me about our diversity initiatives? What do they keep asking about that for? And then it, and it can, then it, that leader is, is quickly acclimated to what the culture of that organization is. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna take a couple of the um, participant questions. So one is, besides anonymous surveys, what other ways can organizations create safe spaces to discuss diversity issues? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of organizations now are doing listening sessions. Um, again, BRGs, I kind of spoke to that, are be really naturally become mm -hmm. um, safe spaces. The BRGs are descended from affinity groups. Mm -hmm. And if you think about affinity groups, if I use that term, we use BRG now, but go back and use the affinity group term. Well, that's mm -hmm. women, you know, or the LGBTQ community, for instance, in your workplace, coming together to create space for them to share their experiences, right? And so that you naturally get some of that uh, safe, you get some of that safety just by, you know, collaborating, communicating with people who are like you, who have the same identity characteristics that you have. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way that you do it. A lot of organizations lately are doing listening sessions. Mm -hmm. I will caution anyone, if you're doing listening sessions, one of the key things though, you've got to have your leaders communicating about it and talking about why it's safe to talk. Um, because again, I, I use the example of, um, that the majority group tends to not like to talk about the dynamics, dimensions of the, of the minority group in a, lot of, in a lot of instances. Well, it works both ways. As an African-American, if I'm working in a company and I can pick up on this and women can pick up, if you're in a minority group, you can pick on this quickly. If I'm working in a company and I pick up quickly that they don't like talking about race and I care about my career, guess what I'm not gonna talk about? Race. I'm not gonna bring it up. Right. Until I know that it's not, there's not gonna be any downside to me bringing that topic up, I'm never gonna talk about it. And so the leaders then have to start creating a space by their own communication, right? Their own communication. And then when you're doing listening sessions as well, you need to be careful that your middle level managers have been properly briefed on what's going on, why it's important. Because if you don't do that, your middle level managers, will, you know, they'll say, yeah, I heard you're in this listening session, but you know, we got this stuff that's due. Skip that and, and do this, right? And that, the signal there is that, okay, this wasn't important. I'm glad I didn't go. And, and, and you know bear my soul because the company really doesn't care about this right so right. so those are just two examples of ways to do it yeah um what have you found from the people facilitating those sessions because i think a lot of folks are wanting to have those conversations but those are difficult conversations how do you how do you help leaders facilitate those conversations yeah we you know we we have a process which we use reflective dialogue to do these for us there's a there's a many other ways to do it mm -hmm. um but we we do reflective dialogue where you have equal opportunity to speak. Um, mm -hmm. The questions are provided in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of things we do during that process to ensure that, that, that we kind of flatten the hierarchy some. Um, but you've got to, I think you've got to ensure there's equal voice. I think you've got to start off by ensuring that there's safety. Um, and I think as far as preparing leaders for the conversation, uh, you know, you can't assume that people, if you're using a tool that's going to require people really to facilitate versus host. Hosting is just calling balls and strikes and listening to people. Facilitating is where you interject more of yourself. You're going to use a tool like that, then you've got to make sure that the people who are doing it have been properly trained, you know, and have the right, um, I call it, so I've been got kind of toying with the term IQ, inclusion quotient, <laughs> which is the same as emotional yeah. quotient, the inclusion quotient, a different kind of IQ, right? But yeah. you got to make sure that people are, are capable of doing that and that are, are, you know, know how to, how to listen and, and lean into the space. Yeah, because that conversation can go south really quick if you, if you don't have the, if the leader's not ready for what they might right. hear and, right. and just reacts to that. So I, let me also say, let me also say listening session. Uh, we also find that oftentimes it's better not to have a leader present when you do oh. them. We're not mm -hmm. have a leader of the department present and to have the conversation and be able to, if you can take notes and kind of highlight it that way and present that back to the leader, that's, that's that can mm -hmm. also sometimes be more valuable. Uh, we had a client recently who, wanted they, we polled them and they said they wanted a leader there but then we still kind of noticed that the comments were you know you, you did that's called it's called sandwiching with tracy you probably heard of which in other words if i'm a, if you're my boss first thing i say is something nice about you yeah then i say something that what i then i say what i really want to say right. but then i close it by saying but tracy's amazing and i remember really tracy she's been an amazing boss right so you don't want to get all of that you want to get to the heart of the matter yeah yeah so Robert, we're getting close to the end here. Just wanted to see if there are any other thoughts or maybe even resources or things that you would um, encourage um, all of us to either you know, reach out to, think about as we're thinking about how we um, uh, either formalize 
or or build up our our DEI strategies in our in our organizations. Yeah, I'm going to pitch the Tennessee Diversity Consortium, which right. is an organization that anyone can join. Um, the Tennessee Diversity Consortium is free. It is. It was started by a group of us in town who were doing DNI work, who recognized that there was a need for us to have a more collaborative working relationship across town. And so, as people within higher ed, within corporate, within nonprofit, within municipal government as well. And we said, you know, oftentimes diversity functions have not a lot of budget, not a lot of people resources. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that we would come together and collaborate so that, you know, we can learn from one another, get smarter and be better stewards to our own organizations. It's, you know, you know Lions Bernstein is a member, they're part of our board, members of the Tennessee Diversity Consortium. And so when I hear Ashley talking about the great stuff they're doing there, it motivates everybody else. DNI and i mm -hmm. oftentimes is rising tides lift all boats. And so, you know, working collaboratively with other people who are in this journey with you, um, we, don't, we don't compete. It tends, you don't tend to have the competition across industry or across company when it comes to DNI. You tend to have people that are willing and, and ready to work together, even if they're in the same industry, which is a really neat thing. So, you know, I would encourage from a resource standpoint, you know, being part of TDC and all you got to do is go to TennesseeDiversityConsortium.com um, uh, and you go there and you can just sign up. The meetings, everything is free. You know, the resources, everything else is free. Um, and so I encourage people to do that uh, as a way to, to, to totally lean into this space. That sounds great. Robert, it's been wonderful talking with you. It was great having Ashley on earlier. Appreciate your insights today. Hope I filled in well enough for Ashley's <laughs> departure. Robert, Robert. That was a big loss, but hopefully Robert, I- Robert, no, you, Robert, <laughs> don't worry. You held up your end of the deal. So I appreciate that very much. I appreciate our participants um, being here today. And thank you all for joining us. Thank Have you. a great afternoon.